Father, I just come before you in the name of Jesus. And I just ask, Father God, as your servant, God, God, that you would use me to serve. Father, use me, Lord God, to bring forth this message, Lord God, in the manner in which you want it to be preached. Father, I submit yourself completely and whole. I submit myself completely and wholly to you this morning, Lord God. And I ask, Father God, that you would just put the words upon my lips that you want me to speak. Father, I cannot do this this morning without you. Because we're not apart from you. I can do nothing. In and of myself, I can do no good thing. So, Lord, I just ask, Father God, that your Holy Spirit would give me wisdom, would give me discernment, Lord God. Father God, would give me the proper attitude in which to preach this message. Father, let your anointing upon this word because it's your word. Not because I'm speaking it, but because it's your word. Father, let your word go forth. Let it touch hearts. Let it touch minds. Let it transform them today. Father, let not one person that has come here today leave the same as they did. But let them be transformed by the washing of your word upon their life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm excited this morning. You know, sort of like Pastor Brandon last week, he was just excited. I'm excited. I'm coming out of my skin. You didn't even ask Lucy yesterday. I was I was telling her, I said, you know what, I'm excited about tomorrow. I cannot wait to get behind the pulpit. And and, and it's because I, I, I'm so excited about being used by God. For whatever he wants me to do. You know, when, when, when Pastor Troy or when anybody comes to me and they say, Can you can you do this? Can you preach this word? Or can you can you do this discipleship class? Can you do this? Can you do that? You know what I always say yes. Because I take that as a word from God. Because if somebody's come to me and asked me to do that, I just say yes because I know that God wants me to be used in that manner for a certain purpose, for a certain time, for a certain people. And I just say yes. I say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Amen. And this morning is no different. I'm so excited about it because I know that God has given me this word for this time, for this purpose, and for this people. You know, as we enter into this time of Christmas, this time of entering into a new year, I, I, I'm just, I'm so excited about it, but for different reasons than most would think. Because I tend to, to, at this time of year, to begin to look back. And I begin to look back over this past year and begin to look at my life and what I accomplished the Lord over the past year. And I begin to ask myself a lot of tough questions because we're getting ready to enter into a new year and and, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the same person in 2014 that I was in 2013. I don't want to accomplish the same things in 2014 that I accomplished in 2013. I want, I want the, the, the works that God has done through me to be greater next year than they were this year. And there's only one way that that's going to happen. And that's if there's a greater commitment on my part. So I begin to ask myself, what are you committed to? What are you committed to? I'm asking myself this because as I enter into this next year, my commitments for next year must be greater than my commitments for this year. The focus of my commitments for next year have to be different than my focus for, of my commitments this past year. Everything's got to be different. At this time of year when most people are looking back and or looking into the next year and they're, they're thinking about those things that they need to commit to over the next year. You know, these, these New Year's resolutions, these things that people plan for but never really accomplish. You know, to, you know things like losing weight and uh, eating better, becoming healthier, to read more of the Bible, to get a deeper and closer relationship with Jesus. They're all good things. But if all they are 
is a New Year's resolution and you haven't really committed yourself to fulfilling those things that you say you want to do, what good are they? <coughs> so I just want to ask some really tough questions this morning because that's what I like to do when I, when I preach is I like to ask questions. And I don't expect any of you to shout out the answers this morning. I, I, I ask you these questions because I want you to begin to, to look inside yourself, to begin to ask yourself these same questions on a daily basis as you move forward in your relationship with the Lord, as you move forward in your relationship with this body. Begin to ask yourself, what am I committed to? What am I committed to? You know, I, 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 while everybody else is preparing to, to, to worship the, 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 the birth of Jesus Christ, I begin to look back at what Christ has already done. Instead of worshiping the, the day that he was born, I begin to look back at the commitment that he made. Because if you think about it, he made a great commitment. He made a commitment to, to, to leave behind all of his godly attributes. He, he, he made a commitment to come in, in the likeness of a man. He, he made a commitment all right from the beginning to come knowing that he was going to die for the, for, for the rest of the world. Amen. He made a commitment that he was going to raise again. He made a commitment that he was going to sit at the right hand of the Father. He made a commitment that he was going to return once again for his, for his blameless, spotless church. And I begin to focus on the commitments that Christ made. And I begin to ask myself over and over and over again, what exactly are you committed to? Because compared to the commitment of Christ, my commitments are so small. So minuscule. only committed to, to coming and living and dying, but he was committed to serving while he was here. He committed himself to serving. He committed himself to healing. He committed himself to saving. He, he committed himself to setting the right example for everyone that he came in contact with. These are the things that he committed himself to while he was here. And I begin to ask myself, what am I committed to? What am I committed to? God the Father was committed to sending His Son to the whole world. God the Father was committed to letting His one and only Son die as a ransom for you. And for me. I begin to ask myself, what is that really to? What am I committed to? God the Father committed to send his one and only son to die for me, and his son Jesus Christ committed to coming and dying for me on the cross knowing beforehand all the pain and all the struggle and everything that he would ever go through as he, as he made his way to that cross. But yet he still committed himself to that and never wavered. Yeah, he spent time in the Garden of Gethsemane and he, he, he wept and he sweat with drops of blood from his forehead. And he did cry out and said, yes, Father, if there's any way that this cup can pass from me. Yes, he said those things, but he followed it up with, with but not my will, but your will be done. And I begin to look at this commitment that my Jesus made. And I begin to <coughs> look at this commitment that my God, my Father has made. And I begin to ask myself, what are you committed to? And I just want to ask you the same question this morning. What are you committed to? What have you committed yourself to? Because Jesus was a man of commitment. Are you a man or a woman of commitment this morning? And if you are, what are you committed to? Because you know, 
know what? Every single one of us in this room, we're going to be committed to something. We are. Whether you realize it or not, whether you've made a mental decision about it or not, every single one of us in this room is going to be committed to something. Some of us in this room are committed to our jobs. We work hard all week long. We make sure that we're there on time. We make sure that we don't leave until we're supposed to. We make sure that we get everything that's on our calendar to get done in that week. We get it done. We're committed to making sure that we give our employer everything that we have while we're there. Some of us are committed to our families, our spouses. We give everything that we are to them. We spend time with them. We do things with them. We go places. Some will commit to making more money this next year so that they can have a better life a nicer house, a nicer car, be able to go on nicer vacations. Some will commit to giving more money this next year. Not giving the same old amount, but making sure that they up the ante just a little bit so they can give just a little bit more and a little bit better to God. Some will commit to managing their time better and some to giving more time to others. So my question to you this morning is what are you committed to? What are you going to be committed to in 2014 that you weren't committed to in 2013? What are you going to commit your life to? What are you going to commit your time to? What are you going to commit your thought to? What are you going to commit your money to? What are you going to commit to in 2014 that you didn't in 2013? You know, I asked myself this. I started doing this a couple years ago, All these, asking myself all these questions about what I'm going to be committed to. Because while we were in Amarillo, Texas, one day I was riding down the road, and something caught my eye. And I looked over to the side of the road, and there was this brand new billboard that just got put up. And the Marines just started this new campaign. And they had all these different new billboards all around town in Amarillo, Texas. But this one caught my eye, and I began to look at it, and I read it, and I was like, what in the world is that supposed to mean? Because I looked up at that billboard, and it said, the Marines committed to a sense of honor. Committed to a sense of honor? A sense of honor? What is that, really? Can somebody explain to me what a sense of honor is? Either you're committed to honor or you're not, right? But I began to see this billboard everywhere that I went. Committed to a sense of honor. Committed to a sense of honor. And it started to bug the sky out. I kept seeing this thing, and I'm like, God, what in the world are you trying to show me? Because every time I go around a corner, I see this stupid billboard committed to a sense of honor. You know what he said to me? He said, just as the Marines are committed to a sense of honor, the church is only committed to a sense of He said, that billboard is a picture of my church. Yeah, they're committed. But they're only committed to a sense of godliness, not godliness itself. Folks, let me tell you something. If we're going to be committed to something, we can't be committed to something that just looks like, sounds like, or smells like the real thing. We've got to be committed to the real thing itself. So if we're going to be committed to God, then we need to be really committed to God. We can't be like those that we preach to out on Bourbon Street or in these neighborhoods that are that are only have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. We gotta be committed to the real godliness because he said, Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Be ye perfect as I am perfect. He didn't say be do, be a sense of holiness. 
Okay? Don't be committed to a, a sense of perfection, but be committed to perfection. Be committed to holiness itself, because apart from holiness, no one will see the Lord. You know, I can't imagine standing before the Lord Jesus Christ at my day and saying, but, but Lord, I was committed to a, a sense of godliness. I, I, I was committed to, 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 to holiness partially. I was, I was committed to, to godliness partially. I was committed to, to striving for perfection partially, but not wholly. Not completely. Not fully. Folks, if we're going to be committed to Christianity, real Christianity, then we've got to be committed to everything that Christianity is. We can't just go through the motions. We can't just come to church. and We can't just begin to pray. We just we can't begin to, to read the Word. We've got, we got to take all those things that Christianity is and begin to live that Christianity in our life. We've got to become obedient to what we're seeing. We've got to become obedient to what we're hearing. We've got to become obedient to what we're reading. Commitment is nothing without obedience. Right. Okay, are you hearing me this morning? Commitment is nothing without obedience. And let me tell you something this morning, folks. The only way that we can be committed to true Christianity and not just a form of it is if we commit ourselves to one thing that is so elusive to so many people. It's so elusive because most, most people don't even understand what it is. They hear it. They read about it. They even say it a lot of times. But it's obvious through their lives that they really don't understand what it is. And that one thing that we need to be committed to in order to live lives of true Christianity to live true lives of, of true godliness is that we need to be committed to obtaining divine grace. We have to be committed to obtaining the mind of Christ. We read about it. We're going to read about it this morning. All about the mind of Christ. We even say that God's given us the mind of Christ. But yet so many times our lives don't reflect it. Amen. And I believe it's because we don't under, truly understand what it means to have the mind of Christ. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk all about the mind of Christ this morning. Because 1 Corinthians 2.16 tells us, For who has known the mind of, Christ, the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It says right there, 1 Corinthians 2.16, We have the mind of Christ. So if you... You've committed yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. You surrendered to Him. Okay? You accepted what He did on the cross at Calvary. Then you have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. The problem is, as many times we do not use it. Because we do not understand it. The only way to obtain the mind of Christ is to know what the mind of Christ is. So this morning we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2. If you'll turn to Philippians chapter 2 with me this morning. We're going to, we're going to read the scriptures uh, 5 through 9. We're going to find out what the mind of Christ is. Philippians 2, 5 through 9. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation this morning because I like the way that this particular part of Scripture is written there. It says, let this mind be in you. That part right there ought to tell us, uh-oh, we need to open up our ears. We need to open up our eyes. We need to pay attention because it says, let this mind. It's getting ready to tell us what the mind of Christ is, okay? Let this mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and become, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, 
and given him a name which is above every name. This morning I want to talk about the mind of Christ and what the mind of Christ is and how we obtain the mind of Christ. The first thing that we find out in this scripture is that the mind of Christ is a submissive mind. The mind of Christ is a submissive mind. Verses 5, 5 and 6 says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He submitted himself to God the Father. I like the way that the Good News Bible says this scripture. It says the attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. Sometimes we have a bad attitude. We have a rotten attitude. We need to have the attitude that Christ Jesus had. It says we should have the attitude that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all that he had. He gave up everything. He gave up everything to come here in the form of man. He gave up everything that he was, everything that he had to come and die on the cross for you and for me. He was in total, complete submission to God the Father. You know why? Because the mind of Christ is not a self-centered mind. It's not a self-centered mind. Christ was not thinking of himself when he came to this earth. He was not thinking of, thinking of himself as he lived each day upon this earth. He wasn't thinking of himself when he went to the cross. He wasn't thinking of himself when he rose again. And he's not going to be thinking of himself when he comes again. Because the mind of Christ is not a self-centered mind. It's not a stubborn mind. Okay? When God spoke, Jesus submitted. When the Father said, Go, Jesus went. When the Father said, do this, he did that. <coughs> How many times when we hear God speak, we're so stubborn that we say, I'm not so sure that the will of God speak in the first place. The word of God is clear, is it not? It says, my sheep, they know my voice, and they listen to the leather, so either we're wrong or God is. So if we hear God speak and we try to write it off as something else, as our flesh, or, or maybe some other thought that somebody put in our mind, we're just being stubborn against the will of God. The mind of Christ is not a stubborn mind, but rather it is a surrendered, submissive mind. One that's given himself to do whatever the Father wants him to do. We need to submit ourselves to the will of God. We need to submit ourselves to the Word of God. We need to submit ourselves to the will of God. Amen. Amen. Christ was submissive to the will of God the Father. He was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That's what Revelation 13, 13, 8 says. And the Word of God says that we are to follow in His footsteps. Jesus himself said, if any man desires to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. But all too often, our flesh desires what it wants. And we give in to that instead of submitting to what God wants. Instead of submitting to God's will, we fulfill our own. Jesus knew that the eternal purpose of God the Father was for him to clothe himself in humanity and become the sacrifice that would secure salvation for all of fallen man if we chose to be obedient, obedient to what it said. He never one time argued with God. Not one time. But how many times have we argued? I can remember myself years ago when I first got saved and God called me to the ministry. I fought with God for an entire year. Who am I to fight with God? Who am I to argue against God's will? Because of those things that I had to begin to ask myself, what are you committed to? Are you committed to fulfilling your will or God's will? Are you committed to fulfilling 
fulfilled in the lust of the flesh, or are you committed to the things of the Spirit? Well, I ask you this morning, because I know you're no different than me. You battle with these things. Because it's right here. The battle's right here. We have these things coming to our mind, and we've got to cast down that vain imagination. We've got to cast down those thoughts that don't line up with the Word of God. And we need to become committed to what the Word of God says. We've got to be committed to obtaining the mind of Christ. something else to do. I, I can't let those people down. Where are we going to let man down? Where are we going to let God down? If God speaks, we need to become obedient. What are we committed to? Are we committed to that submissive mind, that mind of Christ that says, not my will, but your will be. mind of Christ is not only a submissive mind, but it's also a self-abased mind. Philippians 2, verse 7 says, but he made himself of no reputation. See, what Christ did when he came here on this earth is he lowered himself. He lowered himself before man. Can you even imagine what that's like. Because so many times we even have a hard time lowering ourselves before others. We have a hard enough time holding our brother in higher esteem than ourselves, but God himself came down and lowered himself before man. He, he lowered himself before his own creation. He humbled himself before all mankind. He humbled himself before those that, that nailed him to the cross. He was able to do that because the mind of Christ is not a self exalting mind. How often do we want that pat on the back for a well done? How often do we want to be the one that's in the middle of the circle or the life of the party or the one that gets all the attention? How often are we the one that wants to be counted on to, to lead this team here or lead that team there or preach this Sunday or preach that Sunday. How often are we looking to be the one that's in the spotlight? But the mind of Christ is not a self-exalting mind. It's a self-abased mind. We lower ourselves before others. We lower ourselves before God. us. 
to go and point men and women to the Father. There's one thing that Jesus never did. He never bragged about himself. He never bragged about who he was and what he did. And you know what? <coughs> but it's the mind of Christ is also servile. You know what the word servile means? It means to be servant-minded. Are you servant-minded this morning? Verse 7 of Philippians 2 says, And he took upon himself the form of a servant. Have you taken upon yourself the form of a servant? The life of Christ was and still is all about absolute service. He served them and he served them. He serves God, the Father, and he serves man. You see, he came not to do his own will, but do the will of the Father, the one who sent him. And that's our path. That's what we're called to do on a daily basis is serve God. Not man, not ourselves. Scripture says in Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for men. lived his life with complete servitude. And we're called to be a servant of all ourselves. The mind of a servant, a 
serve our mind? Is that the mind that you possess today? Do you give of yourself willingly? Do we serve without having to be asked? Or when times of service come up, do we sneak out the back door before anybody catches us? Do we have that mindset that, oh, somebody else will do that? We shouldn't have that mindset. We ought to put that mindset back where it belongs, back in the past, because that's where that's the kind of mind that we used to have, that worldly mind, that self-centered mind. But we, now we have the mind of Christ. We should have a, a mind of servanthood that's willing to serve others and serve God. Someone who possesses the mind of Christ is someone who willingly serves because he has the heart of a servant. Do you have the heart of a servant? You can't serve if you don't have the heart of a servant. So is he. If we don't think of ourselves as a servant, we'll never have the heart of a servant. We'll always look for a way out. We'll always look for that back door to get out of serving. We need to be the first one that steps up and says, I'll do that. Hey, I'll do that. That should be our attitude. But also often we get caught up in other things. We get caught up in conversation. We get caught up in, in, in gaming. We get caught up in just friendships and, and things like that instead of fulfilling responsibilities. It's our responsibility as those that have and have obtained the mind of Christ to serve. We need to be given to serve God and man in all circumstances, in all situations. And we need to get rid of the attitude that somebody else will do it. We need to have the attitude that if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. Amen? The mind of Christ is also a sacrificial mind. It's a sacrificial mind. Verse 8 says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The mind of Christ is a sacrificial mind. It's a mind that's willing to sacrifice no matter the cost. You know what? Jesus counted the cost before he came. He knew what he was going to have to do. He knew the price he was going to have to pay for you and me. And he was willing to pay. Are you? Have you counted the cost? what it means to be a Christian. Have you counted the cost of the decision that you made when you said, yes, Lord. I thank you for what you did. And I want you to cleanse me from my sins. And I want to be your servant. Have you counted the cost for that? Have you counted the cost of what it means to be a part of the body of Christ? Have you counted the cost? Because it costs Christ. And if it costs him, it's going to cost us. If what we're doing, folks, does not cost us something, then it's not sacrificial. Then what we're doing is not sacrificial. Christ sacrificed himself for us. He hung upon the cross, an instrument of death. A death that was meant for, for, for the worst of criminals the greatest of sinners, yet Jesus was willing to hang on that cross and he had not sinned. He was willing to, to have the world look upon him the way that they did with disdain. Some spat upon him. Some smashed the crown of thorns upon his forehead. Some beat him. He was willing to go through all of that and sacrifice himself for you and for me. And sometimes we can't even sacrifice our own desires. We can't sacrifice our own will for the will of God. We can't sacrifice ourselves and what we want for what our brother and sister wants to need. My question to you this morning is what are you willing to sacrifice for God? Sacrifice something if you're going to obtain the mind of Christ. Are you willing to, to count the cost? And are you willing to pay the cost no matter what that is? And I don't know about you, but the cost of paying the price 
I am, everything that I want to do, every place that I want to go, every desire that I have, that's the price that I have to pay. I have to give it all up for him. I have to lay it all down for what he wants, for his will, for me. And I don't know what your cost is, but I know it's going to cost you everything. What your everything is, I don't know. But the question is, are you willing to pay? Are you willing to pay that price to obtain the mind of Christ, to be that true Christian before the rest of this world? Are you looking for ways to sacrifice for others' benefit today? Are you altruistic? In other words, do you live your life for the benefit of other people? Do you? Are the decisions that you make on a daily basis based upon what you want? And how it's going to affect you? Or based upon what other people want? And how it's going to affect them? Because Christ, every decision that he made was based upon how it's going to affect everybody else. You know what I'm saying? Every decision that he made, every place that he went, everything that he did was all based upon how it was going to affect the lives of everyone around him and not himself. That's the example that, that he set for us. That's the example that we're supposed to follow. Are you willing to pay the price of being altruistic? Are you willing to pay the price of living your life for the benefit of other people or forgetting about yourself? Folks, if we're always looking for ways around sacrifice, if we're, we're looking for the least amount of inconvenience, if we're never willing to compromise for the sake of others, then we really don't have the mind of Christ. We really don't. And we need to sit down and we need to ask ourselves, what am I committed to? Am I really committed to obtaining the mind of Christ? If we are, then we need to lay our lives down for God and for others. Amen. Amen. And lastly, the mind of Christ is a successful mind. Uh oh. Uh oh. Preachers get ready to talk about money. No, no. Money has nothing to do with success. I know a lot of very rich people that are not successful. At least not by God's definition of success. Maybe by a worldly standard, but not by God's standard. Verse 9, in Philippians 2 5, in Philippians 2 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name. You see, the mind of Christ is a rewarding mind. It's a rewarding mind. Now the question is, what are we rewarded with? Well, from the first four things that we found out the mind of Christ is, we already know that the mind of Christ is a submissive mind. We already know that the, the mind of Christ is a self-abased mind, where we lower ourselves, we humble ourselves. Okay? And if we do those two things, we know that we're exhibiting the mind of Christ. So let's look at what Scripture says. First of all, we're going to find out from Scripture that we will be re rewarded with the ability to resist. James 4, 7 says, So humble yourselves before God. That's part of the mind of Christ, right? Okay? Okay? It's a self-abased mind. It's a humble mind. So if we humble ourselves before God, it says resist the devil and the devil will flee. We can't resist the devil and the devil will flee if we don't humble ourselves first before God. So if we have the mind of Christ, if we humble ourselves before him, we're going to be rewarded with the ability to resist the devil so the devil will flee. Hallelujah. But if we have not submitted ourselves, we have not humbled ourselves before God, we'll never be able to resist the devil. Why? Because the devil is not afraid of you. But what he is afraid of is the God inside of you. 
And the only way that God inside of you, that Holy Spirit, is effective in you and through you is if you're first submitted and humble before Him. So we need to work for you. Amen? So we know that God's going to reward us with the ability to resist, to resist the devil, to resist the temptation, cast down the vain imagination, to take every thought captive to the glory of God. We're not submitted and humble for him. We'll never be able to do those things. But if we are, then he gives us the power, the ability to do those things. And secondly, we will be rewarded with exaltation. We'll be rewarded with exaltation. And what greater reward can you and I ever receive than being exalted by the Father just as How much more success do you need? That's success according to God's word. That we can resist the devil and the devil will flee. The devil won't have any power in our life. And then we'll be exalted by the Father himself. That's success. Come on. Mm -hmm. But yet we chase after worldly success. Bigger houses, nicer cars, more money, greater vacations. That's not success in God's eyes. And even those that are leaders in the church, they, they chase after bigger congregations, more people coming in the door. That's not success either. God does not measure success in a church by the amount of people that are sitting in the chairs. God measures success as to whether or not your heart is changing and you're maturing in your faith. And whether you are going out and multiplying yourself. That is success in God's eyes. And what greater reward can we get than being exalted by the Father in heaven because we've achieved those things? The exaltation of Christ was his reward due to his humiliation while he was here on this earth. He was humiliated and God rewarded him for that humiliation because he allowed himself to be humiliated and God's going to reward you because of that. Because you allow yourself to go out and be humiliated by this world. Be mocked. Be made fun of. Be spat upon. Be hit just like he was when you're out there preaching the word of God. Because of that, God will exalt you in due time. Matthew 23, 12 says, Whoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Humble yourselves. Don't try to put yourselves in the middle of the circle. Don't try to put yourselves up on a platform. Don't, don't put yourself in that spot where you're the focus of everybody's attention. Put yourself in a position where you're always pointing to him so that he the center of attention. Put yourself in a position where the light of God, the light of Christ that dwells inside of you can begin to shine out of you so that when other people see you, they don't see you, they see Christ. Because if you possess the mind of Christ, you're on the road to ultimate success. God will exalt you in due time. Try not to exalt yourself. Because those, as we just read, those that try to exalt themselves will be abased. They will be lowered. But those that abase themselves, who humble themselves before God, shall be exalted. Are you committed to this morning? Are you committed to obtaining the mind of Christ? If so, to being self-abased, to lowering yourself, to counting others in higher esteem than yourself, putting your desires aside for the desires of others, being altruistic and living your life for the benefit of other people. You're committing yourself to living a servile life, 
having a servile mind, the, the mind of a servant, that where everywhere you go, you're looking for opportunities to serve other people and serve God. You're committing yourself to a sacrificial life where you put everything that you are aside in order to give your life to God and others. There's no greater love than this, Matthew said, and as John said, than to lay down your life for your friends. Are you willing to sacrifice your life for those around you? And you're committing yourself to having a successful mind. You're committing yourself to submitting and humbling yourself before God so that you can resist the devil and not giving in to that rotten temptation. Not giving in to that, that lustful desire. The word of God says that we should flee those youthful lusts. Not stand around and let them overcome us and overwhelm us and, and, and just get a foothold in our life. You know the devil has no power over you but the power you allow him to have. So we need to stop. We need to commit ourselves to not allowing the devil to have any power over us. And we need to make sure that we're committed to allowing ourselves to be exalted by God and being patient and waiting for that exaltation instead of trying to exalt ourselves. Instead of putting ourselves in that place where all eyes are upon me. It's time to get out of the circle. It's time to put him at the center of everything. So what are you committed to? Are you committed to obtaining the mind of God? Are you? In 2014, our cry should be, Father, let me decrease, that you will increase in my life. 2014 can't be the same as 2013. The struggles aren't going to be the same, I guarantee you. So if our commitment to obtaining the mind of Christ isn't different in 2014 than it was in 2013, we're going to be in trouble. So let's commit together. Let's commit together to obtain the mind of Christ together. Let's become that body that is fitly joined together. Amen. That is of one mind, of one purpose, of one thought, one focus, one vision. His. Amen. Father, we just thank you this morning, Lord God. We thank you for this word, Lord God. We thank you for the word of your power. And let the word of your power become powerful in our lives.